this is something new to me because I've never, ever stood in front of a camera and given an ex exhortation. Um, I've also, this has been a very long time since I've actually uh, spoken in, uh, in South Africa. Uh, I think the last time was before we left for, uh, for the UK. Um, and then we were still in a little building um, in Kempton Park with little red chairs around and um, uh, the aeroplanes taking off every five seconds. So we had to dodge the aeroplanes to what we had to say. Um, which was very interesting um, in the least. But in these past years, um, I've developed a kind of a technique of giving exhortations. Um, I started off with uh, writing them down. And as most people know, especially my wife, um, my writing's worse than a drunk spider. So not even I can read it. So it, it was not good. Um, but then I got to um, the, the new world and started typing them out. Um, and again, found that a little bit difficult to um, keep my thoughts into, into what I was reading and how I was reading, because as most of you know, uh, I'm dyslexic. But um, over the years, I've come to uh, doing it my way, I suppose, is the right way uh, it, 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 for me. And... Um, it's it's been diff, uh, different because I just sometimes um, go off on tangents because there's nothing really written down to keep me in in control and my wife's not next to me to pull my my hand or my shirt to say that um, you know, I've gone off topic or where I'm going with the whole uh, talk. Um, however, I quite like it because I can talk and do whatever I like to, and and no one can stop me because. Um, <laughs> it would be quite funny to see see um, people stopping uh, someone in the in the middle of a talk. However, my talks are kind of really normally quite simplistic as well because I like to have one um, a, a topic to my talk, and I tell everybody that I normally have a topic to my talk. Uh, and um, on my iPad, I've got all my talks, so. Um, I can look at which talks that I've done and where I've done them and uh, date them and uh, um, timestamp them to say that which ecclesia I've gone to because in Scotland we have, um, like in South Africa, a very small amount of uh, ecclesias and they're very um, small so we get to know everybody in Scotland and uh, who they are and uh, where they are, come from and how they are keeping and uh, not, uh, unlike England which is quite big and well, bigger than Scotland and also America and all uh, uh, and Australia, they're quite vast, so we don't know so many of them. However, uh, we notice that a lot of people are going all over the world because we sit and talk to people in uh, Australia, uh, Paul, for instance. And um, I'm going off topic again quickly, so I'll have to get back onto it. As I said, my, my to topics are normally um, there, but I'm not going to give it today because I thought that maybe you could take a guess at, at it halfway through what I'm going to be talking about. And at the end, I must probably tell you what the topic is anyway. Um, and yeah, um, I don't know if it's like everybody else in, in this world, but I specifically, I was noticing it, um, last week when um, uh, Brother, St <laughs> Brother Stephen was talking, um, that I had latched myself onto something else that he, um, was in the, the, the verse that he was reading out of Genesis and um, because of what he said. So he was saying that um, Israel had got to this mountain and he recognized that God, had, God was there and he had established this um, pillar to, to worship God. Um, but he also then was mentioning his dream and that dream that uh, there was a stairway from from heaven to the earth. And that kind of piqued my interest really, because I was sitting there thinking, we as a, a, as a human entity, uh, which God made us, we tried that. Um, and I know I'm saying the, the royal we, uh, but if we look at, um, the Tower of Babel, we tried to make that connection between 
uh, the earth and, and, and the Lord G, uh, and God. And um, God said, no, we're not allowed to. And then dispersed us all into different um, languages so that we all couldn't understand each other and continue making that, that tower. Um, so it, it was quite interesting to me that there is actually a connection between the earth and God. And, and, it, and the interesting part was, it, if you look at the dream, and only at the dream, it's a permanent connection. There's a stairway between heaven and earth. And it sounded like a permanent connection where the angels could go up and down and, and come in, uh, go to heaven and then come back to the earth. And, uh, and um, so it was that connection that I was looking at, that, 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 that permanent connection. And I got quite way laid because I kind of, kind of started thinking about other things about, um, oh, hold on, I've heard this mountain before um, and his father had been there and he also built a pillar there. And I'm like, oh, very interesting. Um, and this is a place of God and, and obviously God's been there. And um, it came to mind that this is a place, this is a place of God. And I was thinking, wouldn't that be good if there were four pillars? And you might think, oh, Charles has gone a bit crazy. And maybe he has, but four pillars would indicate a structure of a, a, a structure, a, a room or, or a house has four main areas which they are kind of built around. So like a, a room. And so if that had four pillars there, it would be even better, wouldn't it? Because then it would definitely indicate the house of the Lord. And that would be extremely good. Um, but do, do we all do this? This is my question to you. Do we all kind of um, focus on other things where, when people are, are giving talks and, and get not dis, it's not and get distracted? And it's not even the right word I'm looking for because I, I don't get distracted. I, I kind of um, carry on listening to uh, whoever's talking. But, but I, I'm kind of building on what is said in my mind. So I feel that when I come to the bread and the wine, that I'm actually very invigorated and I'm enthusiastic about the bread and the wine and the whole meeting in general. And so th this went on for a little bit more because I carried on reading and then stumbled across um, the big oak tree. Uh, and it was quite pertinent for my uh, talk today and hopefully it's not going to be too long because sometimes I can talk a lot uh, and I don't stop talking um, but I came across the big oak tree and the big oak tree was um, where they hid all the false gods and all the uh, other gods and hid it away underneath that tree before they actually went and met his brother um, which was another quite interesting point because under that oak tree they also buried the uh the um the um uh, uh, what do they call them uh it, it was um maybe they only have uh, i'll remember it later i can't remember the name at the moment it's gone right out of my head um so anyway, um, this woman was buried there as well. And um, it, it, it kind of got me thinking about the whole idea of he knew that these people had these gods. He knew that these people were bringing, him, bringing them along on the journey towards a meeting with his brother. So he knew all this, and he also then, um, he must have known about it because uh, it, it's recorded that he actually asked for them to be collected and wanted to show his, his brother that he had changed and, and, and there, there's a difference in him now, uh, now to when he fleed and ran away from him. But... 
it's that little thing that got me thinking about another little topic, which was totally different, really. Uh, uh, but not really that different, because if you think about it slowly, we, I can work it in to, uh, to the talk. And, uh, and I'm going to work it into the talk, because basically this is my talk about it. And it got me thinking about the, the whole um, episode about, uh, sorry, I'm playing with the, 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 uh, the iPad at the same time, the whole thing about um, shouldn't be unequally yoked. And maybe I've just given my topic away there. Uh, 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 and it brought me back to 2 uh, uh, Corinthians chapter, uh, verse, um, chapter 6, where it states that um, we shouldn't be unequally ver um, yoked in verse 14. Do not be yoked together with unbelievers, for that do righteousness and wickedness have in common. Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? What honor is there between Christ and Balaam? Or what does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? And so when I was thinking about this, it got me to think because um, shortly afterwards, I was asked if I could do the, exit, uh, the excitation for today. And I thought, yes, um, because my thoughts are now alive with all this in my head, maybe I can actually uh, expand it to, to everybody on, on, on what the thoughts were. And I kind of brought those thoughts even further apart because I started thinking about what is this whole, um, what is this whole thing about yoked and unyoked uh, and why should we be unevenly yoked? And when you really think about it, are we as brothers and sisters and children of God, are we uh, yoked and walking in that same direction? And maybe that will become a little bit clearer later on. So I looked, I started looking at that almost instantly after after uh, the ex uh, the exhortation anyway, because it kind of fascinated me anyway. And um, the dictionary has a lot of uh, variations of that. And the dictionary says as follows, well, the one that I liked anyway. So it says, a device for joining together a pair of draft animals, especially oxen, usually containing a piece of crosswood with two bow sharp pieces, each enclosing the head of an animal. A pair of draft animals fastened together by a yoke. Now, that, that, that's very interesting because these, th these animals are now fastened together for a reason. It, it helps them. The whole thing about a yoke is to clamp them together and have them walking in a direction that either they want to walk in, free direction, so both of them have to walk in the same direction, or a direction that is given to guide them and, and draw them in a direction that a human would want them. And oxen in those days were taken and used to um, plow the fields. And more modernly today, um, they are for, uh, still a, some of them are still a used for horses, for carriages. So it helps them to all stand in a, right, a, a straight line and, and be guided in the direction that someone is controlling them to go. So, and, and there's the, the operative word really, is they are controlled in a direction where they both need to or have to go. And we can see this happening in the Bible quite a number of times. And if we look at specifics, because I wanted to look at a couple of specifics, and the one that really drew me was Numbers 25, verses 1 to 5. And again, you don't have to look these up because I'll read them out. I've got them all printed down on my iPad. Lovely little gadget that you can pay, copy and paste it, and you can have it all in front of you. It's brilliant. Um, I can't do without it, actually. It, it, makes my life much easier. 
Um, so Numbers 25, while Israel was standing in Shittim, the man began to include include in uh, include in sexual immoral uh, immorally uh, immorality with Moab women, who invited them to sacrifice to their gods. The people ate the sacrifice sacrifice sacrificial meat and bowed down before these gods. So Israel's yoked themselves to the to Baal Peor. And Yahweh's anger burnt against them. And Yahweh said to Moses, take all the leaders of, of these people, kill them and ex expose them in broad daylight before Yahweh so that, the, so that Yahweh's fierce anger may turn away from Israel. So Moses said to Israel's judges, each of you must put to death those of the people who have yoked themselves to Baal Peor. So now we have a very interesting um, issue here. So people from Israel have now come across and actually bonded, bonded themselves, tied themselves to the heathen, the, 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 the people outside the world, and actually started bowing down and eating sacrifices and, and worshiping Baal Peor. So they've gone a, totally again, they've uh, again just totally gone and ignored God and all that he has done for them and, and gone and worshiped a, a different God and gone and eat the, the sacrifices again, just walked away. So we, we can kind of see this thing r repeating itself over and over again through the whole uh, history of the Israelites. Um, and maybe we can even see it still at the moment where they're not actually, they've gone off. A lot of them have gone off and uh, gone and done their own thing and uh, gone and worshiped their own thing. And if I might be using the wrong frame, but gone and worshipped their money instead of gone and uh, gone to uh, follow God and, and strayed away from God, um, but yet having the pretense that they are still uh, God's people, um, which then comes back to us again, doesn't it, brothers and sisters? Because if you really think about it, we are yoked. Uh, we are yoked uh, to the Lord Jesus Christ. So this book, this history book that we have called the Bible, showing us examples of what happened with Israel and the Jews. And do we pay attention to this? And when we, we are yoked to Christ, how evenly are we yoked in that relationship? And yes, we might never be exactly even until uh, he returns and establishes God's kingdom again, where, where in a twinkling of an eye, we will be changed. And um, we will be the same as God in, in mind and in, in thoughts and in, in actions and everything we do. But at the moment, uh, this is what we have to look at because we have to look at the moment we are in. And we have to remember that we are yoked with our Lord Jesus Christ. And we don't want to be too unevenly yoked because when you are, that yoke is going to be at an angle. And, and what happens? Which angle do you think it's going to be at? Well, I was thinking if that angle and the center is God, if the center is God, and then you have Christ, which is closest to the center, and then you have us, which is the furthest away from that center. So if we're going on that walk towards the, the, the kingdom of God, our, our center is obviously going to be longer, and we're going to be drawn in this massive arc, walking away, further away from that path and that straight and narrow gate. And we don't want to do that. 
So we want to be closer in line in that arc, in that walk towards that kingdom so that we can try and stay on that path and not go off and stumble and fall over the rocks and be picked up again and then held back onto the path and straight and narrow way towards the kingdom. And we know that path is long, but my talk, I'm going off topic, um, is not about that. My talk is trying to show you that that bond between that yoke between us and Christ is there and should be there. And how I would like to more like to explain that the best part of this whole thing is when we sit here and we learn and, and, and we think about things that happen while, we, while, while someone's standing up in front, in front of us and reminding us of the walk towards that kingdom, that it actually helps us stay on that path because i was thinking in, in, in the whole process i was told a good number of years ago now when i was um, way early in my um, in my walk towards the kingdom um that we must read the bible we must do our daily readings but i've come to understand that sometimes if you do that a lot of the time not just sometimes but a lot of the time if you sit there and you do your daily readings very religiously all three readings you're actually just doing your readings you're not actually absorbing that thing into your life into your into your brain into uh, and, and i'm going to use the word absorbing a lot because i i i, I, I sat up on a friday night um thinking how am I going to give my talk? And that word just popped into my head over and over and over and over again. So it's going to come out now in, in my talk. And it then spurred me to think about how did Christ do it? Because he's so close to the center. He's so close to, 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 to God. He's taken God on, not just in literal form and to show everybody but he physically took him on and, and, and he could at any point um give us a verse and and, and give us a, a a um an outcome of what was going to happen and in his miracles that he had compassion on on the boy on the stretcher and all those little nuances that he had always pointed towards his father and showed that his father loved us and his father had compassion on us and that how do we do that because we we don't always do that in our life do we we, we don't always have that ability of um trying to trying to uh show god in the right light um, and sometimes we get distracted by the things of the world however Christ never did a and I kept on trying to think and trying to wonder because brother Llewellyn <laughs> uh, yeah brother Llewellyn in his talk mentioned that um, the family was exceptionally poor. And so how, how did Christ have the ability to, to um, absorb everything that God gave him? Because if he, if he was exceptionally, if their family was exceptionally poor, he didn't have the ability we have today where we can pick up our iPads or our Bibles or, or, or any form of media and start reading the Bible, download it onto our devices and then start reading the Bible and, and, get, a note, and get a sense of what God was like. So he had to have some other medium of getting that word absorbed into his body into his mind into his heart and, and then expelling it back out to everybody around him 
because even in in, in Luke, um, in Luke chapter two verses, uh, and this is quite a long one, verses uh, forty-one to fifty-two. Uh, can I read this to you? It says, "Every year Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem for the festival for the Passover. When he was twelve years old, they went up to the festival." according to the custom. After the festival was over, while his parents were returning home, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. But they were unaware of it. Thinking he was in their company, they traveled on a day. Then they began looking for him amongst their relatives and friends. When they did not find him, they went back to Jerusalem to look for him. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting amongst the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. Everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. Well, I'll carry on reading in a bit. Uh, uh, there again, he's 12 years old. He's now amazing everybody around him by his questions and his answers to them as a little boy. And I think we are told quite a few times from the Lord Jesus Christ of a very important fact. And I'll just carry on reading first and then get explained to what the, the thing is. Um, uh, his mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Why were you searching for me? He asked. D didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? But why... Did, why did, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. Then he went down to Nazareth with them and obeyed them. But his mother treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus grew in wisdom, stature, and in favor with God and man. Well, as I said, they, didn't, they couldn't afford a Bible. Or well, they couldn't afford those scriptures. So where did he get this from? And my question is, where did he get this from? Well, he got a lot of sustenance from the angels and a lot of thought, but he still had to open his heart and his mind to it. And we could see that he did because even in, as, a, as a child, he could take that in. And that's why Christ, I think, I could be wrong, that's why Christ mentioned it quite a couple of times. Bring those children unto me, because it's them that are going to absorb all the learnings. It's them that are going to absorb it and take it in and open their minds and show the, show the world around them that um, my parents are like this. If you want to see an image of my parents, look at me. If you want to see an image of my family, look at me. And he, he says it in numerous occasions, doesn't he? He says it quite a few times. Um, uh, Mark chapter 10, verse 13 and 15. People were bring, bring, bringing... Oh, that's not the one. Sorry. Uh, I jumped something here. Um, sitting down, Jesus called the twelve and said, Anyone who wants to be first must be the very last and the, ser uh, and the servant of all. He, looked, uh, he, he took a little child whom he had placed amongst them. He took a little child whom he placed amongst them, taking the child in his arms, said to them, Whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me. Whoever welcomes me does not, does not welcome me, but 
the one who sent me. So he's saying that we have to be like little children to be able to absorb everything that is written in this book, this book, this book for us, for learning, this history book. Um, and not just learn it, but absorb it, absorb it into every fiber and every being that we are. So this is the important part thereof. And my plea to everybody that if we walk with God's word absorbed in us, that yoke, that arc that we keep on trying to create because of the world around us will be less interfering with the way that we try and show God out to the world and try and show people around us that we are different. And we have a couple of uh, other verses that I have, but this is more for inspiration than, than anything else. And let, let's see if we can gain inf inspiration from it. So 1 Corinthians 15, and it's quite a long one this time because I wanted to include everything. And I'll be, this will be my, at the end, my conclusion as well. There are also heavenly bodies and there are earthly bodies, but the splendor of the heavenly bodies is one kind and the splendor of the earthly bodies is another. The sun has one kind of splendor and the moon another and the stars another and the star differ from this uh, sorry, and the sun differ from the star splendor. So will it be with the resurrection of the dead? The body that is sown is perishable. It is raised in imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown in a natural body. It is raised in a spiritual. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. So it is written, the first man, Adam came, uh, the first man became a living being. The last Adam, a life-giving spirit. The spiritual did not come first, but the natural. And after that, the, nat the spirit spiritual. The first man was the dust of the earth. The second man is of heaven. As was the earthly man, so are those who are of the earth. And as is the heavenly man, so also are those who are of heaven. And just as we have borne the image of the earthly man, so shall we bear the image of the heavenly man. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trump will sound, the dead will be raised in, imperishable and we will be changed for the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. So, brothers and sisters, the, yeah, in front of us with the bread and the wine is a reminder to us that we have accepted that invitation that when Christ returns, we will be putting on 
that white gown in marriage with the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you. Amen.